Okay, so yeah, I am going to do a demo. I'm going to talk about uh, visually debugging um, programs. But first, I just want to talk shortly about uh, inspiration. So uh, does anybody know who this guy is? <laughs> Brett Victor. Uh, last year, he gave this really nice talk called Inventing on Principle. And the talk had uh, a lot of themes about how you should decide what to implement based on uh, your key goals, but the, the most concrete thing he showed, which made the talk extremely popular and wowed everyone, was this interactive um, Mario debugger using JavaScript or something like that, but uh, it was, as far as I can tell, a mock-up because you know, nothing ever came of it, it was just an idea. Uh, but of course it makes you think how, how could things be, how visual can your programming environments really be. And, but you can also have uh, negative inspiration. So when uh, we announced uh, that Prezi was sponsoring Elm, there was a Hacker News thread about it. And this was one of the comments that really stuck with me. This guy was like, so we said that we don't really want to write JavaScript because it costs too much time to maintain. And his rebuttal was, there's no debugger, so there's no point in even considering Elm. And that, you know, that's the motivation in a negative way. <laughs> um, so my first reaction when I heard this, <laughs> yeah, we have a type checker, so do, do, we, do you really need to do that? Type checking. I've heard this a lot from Haskell people, but <laughs> who, who really believes this? So the second thing was, maybe a debugger would be useful, but definitely not for interactive programs. Has anyone tried to debug mouse moves in JavaScript? What you do is you set a breakpoint for your mouse move handler, and then as soon as you move your mouse, it steals the focus, and then you want to hit continue, but to hit continue, you have to move your mouse, <laughs> and then you can't, you get into a point where you're not sure which events are real and which ones are generated because it stole the focus and then put it back. So I thought, if, if you're going to do a debugger, I assume that this guy was talking about a line-by-line -line debugger because that's how every single debugger works that I've ever seen. And I think that for what Elm is good at, that's no use. So there must be a better way. And that was my inspiration for this demo. So I think that what <coughs> made this, uh, what makes this possible is that Elm is unique. So when you first meet Elm, you think, your first impression is usually Haskell syntax. Then of course there's FRP, you can't do anything without uh, signals and then it runs in the browser. But this, you could have any number of languages that have these features, but that's not what makes Elm particularly special, in my opinion. There are three things, which I'll show you now, and you'll understand in a second why they are so important. The first one is uh, that all mutable state is in a sig signal graph. Basically, it's the value on your fold piece and nowhere else. All events enter the signal graph through Elm Notify, which otherwise is called the global event dispatcher, whatever you want to call it. And there's a third thing, which is a lot less um, concrete, which is that external state is provided by single purpose high level APIs. So what does that mean? It means that you can't do get time, you can't do set interval, there's two ones that are commonly used, FPS and every, and they both have specific purposes. They only give you one value at a certain interval, and so FPS is used when you want to do frames. And you could use it for other things, but the fact that we have these really high-level APIs, then you know what they're gonna get used for means that we can make them do something else and still know how your program is going to react. So I think it's time for the demo. So um, this is Mario. 
I'm sure you've seen Evan demo this before. And uh, we can restart the application, and here's Mario, and I can jump. But there's a small bug in this program, which is that sometimes he can jump twice, but not always, only sometimes. So I pause the program, and we have 168 events, and because it's an FPS game, that means 168 frames. So we can grab the slider and uh, go back in time and see that yeah, here he jumped once and here he jumped twice and then again once. But you still, so what I could do is I could put him here and then you know try to change the code and re replay the application, but I really want to see what his path was. Um, so, I want to see what he went. So if you notice, I put this import debug at the top. And uh, I'm going to just add one thing here. Make sure that you have hot swapping turned on. So I'm going to add a debug.trace path, and I have to give it an ID so it can track it across frames. And then it will show me where Mario went. And now, if I rewind, <coughs> he, can, he follows the path exactly as I expect. <laughs> so, um, now let's figure out why he can double jump. Because that's the point of a debugger, right? So you can see in this one, if you look down here, you can see his velocity x, velocity y, and his x and y position. And the important thing right, is velocity, velocity y. So it's at 4, then 3.5, then 3, then 2.52, 1, 0, and now he starts going down. And on the second jump, right before he gets to zero, six again. So he's jumping again. And what is happening at that time that wasn't happening here? So here we have 0 0.5. And we can see what keys are pressed. Only 37 is pressed. And then if we fast forward back to the top of this, parabola, we can see that 38 is pressed. So if you hold down the key when you're at the top of the parabola, then you will jump again. Um, but why is that? So let's just play around and see if we can figure out. So let's go to our editor, and we here's our velocity, our y velocity. So we can click on this number, and we can move it down. and you see how he can jump more or less depending on the velocity. <coughs> and I think if we put it to six, that's strange. At six, he can double jump. 6.1, he can't. And at 6.5, he can. 6.4, he can't. So I think it has something to do with the 0 0.5. And uh, if we inspect this code, we see that he can jump if his, uh, if his y is greater than 0, if the y, that's the keyboard y, is greater than 0, and his velocity is, great, is equal to 0. That's wrong, right? So if we go back to 6.0, there's the double jump. We should, he should only be able to jump when he's on the ground, meaning y equals zero. So if I just delete this, there you can see that he can't double jump anymore because you can see the path, exactly what's gonna happen in the future. So that's um, the debugger. I hope you can all understand this graph um, generated with graphviz. Um, so before I go back to the slides, I just want to mention that 
Evan designed this system. I will show you how I implemented this, but it did not involve any modifications to the Elm runtime except for um, wrapping the time uh, API so that it doesn't use set timeout and annotating the nodes. So most of my Elm changes were just putting strings in that this is a lift and this is a pulpy and this is a merge so we could make a nice graph. All of the cool debugging, the <coughs> rewinding, pausing, restarting was, did not need any changes to Elm. So Elm is a very restrictive language in the type system and um, it's not like JavaScript where you can do anything. You can't access any state. But restrict restrictions are not an absolute thing. You, if you're more restrictive in one area, you can be more flexible in another area because that can make all sorts of assumptions about what state you can and can't use. And <coughs> so Evan claims this was unintentional, <laughs> that he didn't know this would be possible when he originally designed the system. But uh, I just want to stress how well, how, how strong the ideas must be, like how pure and amazingly it was designed that it could do this because originally my idea for this presentation was just the signal graph because I thought yes we can access like the inputs and then we can just go through the tree and we can generate a cool graph and then I thought wait there's this L notify thing could I move time backwards and then once I figured that out on Tuesday I said to Evan I said like yeah this is cool reminding is cool but wouldn't it be better if you could just see the path and so on Tuesday, I added that little path um, drawing. And then yesterday, I said, you know what would be even better if you could just drag the values up and down? <laughs> and I did this yesterday. And my point is that each of these things is just a small incremental improvement because the Elm system was there originally. How did I implement this? So pausing, um, there's this Elm notify. So anytime you want to send a value to a node, you have to go through Elm notify. So really all I do, oh, first I should show you the code. Here how it works. So if I view the source of this, you can see. Um, There's your Elm module, as you would expect. And the only thing that's different, only thing is right down here at the very bottom. Can you see it? Where it says Elm full screen, Elm debugger attach. That's all. So since I get to view the module before Elm gets to see the module, I can override certain things. So I wrap Elm notify, and it basically works like this. If we're paused, we forget the events because there's some things like FPS, which will keep generating events. And if you're rewinding, you know, it's gonna trigger a callback. It's gonna try to do an Elm notify and you just wanna drop it because you already have the, all the events recorded here. When they play back the original time, you recorded the events. And so we do the notify and then we record the value. And the important thing here is this is only possible in a pure functional language because this, you know this value can never change, it's immutable. The restarting, it's also pretty simple. Uh, so you have to wrap set timeout to be able to support FPS. So if we're doing the module initialization, which means the, the FPS is set, setting its first callback, then we want to record those callbacks. And then, if we're not initializing, we don't need to record anything. We can just forget about it. Then we need to record the timer ID and we need to keep the timer ID. Because when we reset the program, we need to cancel all the pending callbacks. That means all these timer IDs so that no more callbacks from the old program come when we start the new one. And then we re-execute all of the callbacks that were attached when the module initialized. So as far as the module is concerned, it ju was just initialized and it runs as if it had just started, the browser had just refreshed. This is graphviz plus mscripten. I didn't do that part. There's, it's on GitHub, it's called viz.js. You can just give it a string and it gives you back an SVG and then you set the inner HTML and then you have 
And even better, you, there's SVG DOM API, so you can just, as the program is running, you can just set these types of values. You don't have to recompute the graph. The time slider. So obviously the program can only go forwards in time. So to simulate going backwards in time, you just reset the program and then go forwards again. So if you have a really long program, you think that's a serious limitation of this thing because if you have a really long history, you'd have to reset it go forwards. But actually, we can access the state of the nodes at any time. So we could just cache like every 100 events and then we'd only have to jump back 100 and play forward. But for this implementation, I always go back to the beginning. Uh, the number slider, that was really easy. Code mirror can get you the token at the cursor, and then all you have to do is replace the string, and there's already hot swapping implemented, so it's good. Hot swapping, this is interesting because um, Evan already implemented hot swapping, and he wrote a blog post about it, how hot swapping is better in Elm because you can tell when it's gonna work and when it's not. That means if the signal graph has changed. But there are some programs where hot swapping in that way doesn't work. You can imagine if you have a, a function that you know, is counting up and then when you get to 10, you reset it to zero. And then you change the, it in your code so when you get to five, you reset to zero. If you'd hot swapped when it was at nine, it would just keep going up. So you can get, still get into states that could not have existed before in your original program. With my implementation, it records the actual inputs. So even if your code changes, it will still, it will restart it and play back from the beginning. That's how when we deleted the, the VY, the changed VY to Y, it reset the program, played it forward and drew the path and showed you that he was not able to jump higher. And then debug trace path. So you have to give it an ID because it takes a, an element and it sets a property on it, which is the debug ID. And then between each frame, it just crawls through the, the whole collage tree, looking for things that have debug IDs and then saving their, their position. Simple as that. So the point I want to emphasize is that Elm is pretty restrictive and a lot of people, especially not, not these people, but new people ask why can't we have you know, inline JavaScript? Why can't you know, I have some other way to access state? And, but the point of Elm is that it's restricted in a particular way and now you don't just have to say it's, we do it for fun, we do it because it's cool, we do it because it's functional, we, you can say we do it because it has real practical value. You can actually visualize time and <coughs> debug the state of the signal graph. Thank you. If you want to run it on your machine, you have to check out my branch of Elm uh, and switch to the Elm debugger. My re repo, switch to the Elm debugger branch, cabal install, go to my copy of Elm Lang, which has the editor, um, and then also go to the Elm debugger branch and run that. And then you will get, if you put no debug, you'll get the old one. And if you just take that off, you'll get an awesome debugger with graph visualization. So um, one thing I didn't mention, I don't know if anyone wants to ask this, but what are the limitations? <laughs> what doesn't it work with? What? Oh, I did the, there we go. So uh, here's something that it doesn't work with. Let's restart. Here's Mario. I'll put in the trace path. And now I'm going to resize the window. Oh, it's because it's hot. That's why. So if I restart, 
No resize the window, what's going to happen? Is it a bug? I thought it was a bug. It's not a bug. That's where Mario used to be. be because if you have a program that depends on window dimension, then that's where he used to be. And then you resize your window and you moved your Mario. And then you can also resize it. But maybe that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is you notice that, so it's running right now, I can jump. But then if I want a hot swap, I say, okay, he can't go, he can't jump so high. But now it's paused. There's no continue button. I do have a continue button, I hit it because it, it's possible. So instead of just recording the async callbacks at the module initialization, you have to record all async callbacks ever. And then when you pause, you remember which ones hadn't executed yet. And then when you continue, you execute those async callbacks. And you, you also have to do the same thing for events. Maybe, maybe not. It's easy. The problem is it doesn't make a good demo because what you do is you jump Mario and Mario's in the air and you're holding down the buttons and you're like, I want to pause it here and you pause it. And then when it's paused, you let up the, the key, your keyboard keys and you get, it gets an album notify and it's paused so it drops that. And then when you restart, you know, you can't stop him because he thinks that the keys are still down. So there's some trickier things with continue that I didn't want to demo. And also, I guess that it doesn't work with HTTP. Um, I mean, other external state, you have to somehow mock, mock out the way that time was mocked out in this example. Any other questions? But you could create like a WHTT client that would connect up to it and be like- you Oh yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I mean, have you, if, you've, if you've done JavaScript programming, Ajax JavaScript programming, I mean, uh, whoever was here at MLJS when Yuha did the BaconJS workshop, he was doing uh, FRP with Ajax requests. And the first thing you do is you set up a mock Ajax, uh, mock server for your Ajax library. And then you can just say that like this request will always return this value and then, and then it works fine. I'm Yeah, yeah, so get requests, things that don't have external state, so get requests could be fine, but if you wanted to post requests, how would that work? So there's some libraries that may or may not be so simple. But the main, uh, so the main difference, here's my debugger, how many, it is 450 lines of JavaScript. Um, no, that's not what I wanted to show, I wanted to show you time. So I've modified time. So instead of doing set time out, it does elm that run delayed. And it's the same as, it's so elm is the run time here. And elm that run delayed is set time out. So you give it a function and you give it how many milliseconds. The difference is that I can override it when I attach the debugger. Captures everything. What does so F stand for in function F? Where? This function is named F. It's just a nominal name. <laughs> okay. It's not that it stands for function. Okay. <laughs> I, I have another talk about state of the JavaScript. Okay. <laughs> what was your question? <laughs> Evan wanted this, and I think not, because uh, in a simple program, yes, but there's a lot of programs where a signal is created by an expression, not by a function. Yes, and but if you're using my graphical element, it would always be associated with this. Yes, that's true. <laughs> and furthermore, if you're using like a module, there's two two types of ELM code, right? There's the stuff that runs in signals and there's the setup code. 
And so you can have a function that dynamically creates, you, you want, you want like five signal nodes. You can create five signal nodes and that's just gonna run on initialization, right? So it's possible that you have nodes that are created by some module that you don't know about and you're using them and they're like dynamically created at startup time. So it's not necessarily always associated with a function name. That's what I'm trying to say. And secondly, yeah, so here's, this is, the, this is the thing about this, is I'm not sure what's easier to understand. This is the program, this part, this bottom part. This is FPS, and this is your keyboard. Because our keyboard has three events, up, down, and blur, and then it merges them all together, and then drops a piece, and then converts them to a record, and then drops a piece, and then that's your code. So the Mario game is actually really small. Oh, and this is in the dimension really just these notes. Okay, but can you build something on a larger scale, like for example, the box? Uh, yeah, so just, the, like just the way that we have legends, this should be all be in a box, and it should say keyboard.arrows. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That, that would be good. All right. And it should, so as a uh, Prezi employee, my natural um, inclination here is to make this zoomable, because if you have a, if you, yeah. If you have a really complex program, you're gonna have lots of nodes, and you're gonna to need to collapse some of them and zoom in on some of them. That, that is another project. Yeah, you, you might not even want to make them very small and zoomable, but just collapse them into a block that's yeah. called by the module. One thing that I thought about for the next version of graphical Ellen is to be able to add a group of nodes, which would just be a named list of nodes and when you collapse that group, it would act as if it was a node that had the dependency of the external dependencies yeah. of that group and the dependence of the external dependence of that group. Yeah. Did I make this slide? I don't know. Uh, this is my favorite signal graph. <laughs> <laughs> Just because the order of the legend is random, but it, it's, it knows the right thing to do here. <laughs> Turtle? Oh, yeah, one and second. this is actually a great example of why just signal loops are really important yeah. because if you have everything in a full sea, this doesn't matter. Oh, so cool. That's, well, that's true. So, yeah, but I, what I wanted you to show here is that time is actually going backwards. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just the, the, the values that are in it, yeah. Um, which one? Which one did you want? Uh, I wanted to try time. this one. Because this one is, this one will demonstrate to you that it's not sampling. Uh -huh. So every time you move the mouse, it's recording more events. And then when we pause, there's no gaps, right? It's just whatever we did with the mouse. This one, that's the Zelda one. Where's the turtle? Examples. And then the intermediate step. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> so, what do you notice here? What I notice is it's exactly the same as the Mario Kart. Yeah. <laughs> it's keyboard and time and FPS. Yeah. And what's interesting is that even though it's paused, the animation is still playing. <laughs> I know it's a gift, but did you notice in Mario? So when yeah. you have, if you restart and then you, you jump with him, oh, I made that way too small. But when you pause, you can rewind to a point where it's paused, but he's actually moving. <laughs> Actually, someone, um, so, so Dobie uh, posted his, something about Mario, um, and, or his meme, and on yeah. Hacker News, someone said, oh yeah, I went on the Elm uh, site, and it was really easy to make Mario moonwalk, so just by swooping, you know, yeah. he's going right, he's actually going backwards. <laughs> yeah. But that was really funny. I also
also tried this one in the debugger, and it was a little bit more complicated. Have you seen it? You haven't seen it? So, uh, what happens here? Yeah, the state is huge. <laughs> it, it goes off the screen in both directions. <laughs> So, this is exactly the problem um, with the full these thing. Are, these are all the blocks, right? Yeah. So, uh, for some reason, he represented the blocks not as integers or position, but actual width and height, width and height and position. It's object oriented programming. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. Well, maybe but each could be an index. So, you know, this could be like how many index like six, seven, and then this would be eight, nine, ten. Well, but it's more modular this way because yeah. you then have like different shaped blocks or different size blocks. That's true. So how do we solve this? This massive state. How do you minimize it? Zooming, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's the obvious. <laughs> so yeah, it's like the Chrome debugger. They have like heuristics. Yes. Just it's like okay, yes, I'll do what you say. I'll show all my parts, but when you have a list of like two hundred, maybe it's good to collapse. Also, I did make one more modification, which is I had to hack show to sometimes use um, two decimal places and sometimes use none, because otherwise you would get really long numbers. So that you could trace, and then it would show yeah, up. So the value would, would always show. Up. Yeah. Okay, that's true. Yeah, I think you'd have to be trickier than how you represent it. So maybe uh, you need some trick where you get the value in the coordinates above and the y, and it has some effect on the coordinates. So it would be, you'd have to start like. Yeah. Because I think that you would be zooming in and say, all right, that's all right. Function is actually yet another example of a graphing calculator that is cheaper and more powerful than CI eighty six. The parabola, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also thought about this. Yeah. So this was before I had the trace path and everything. I just had the signal graph and the recording, and I thought, could you make an automated test out of this? Uh, I don't know. So the problem is that, yeah, it would work for a specific version. So you send it, you connect it to Firebase, where's Danish, and then you, <laughs> and then someone else can debug your running program. That would be cool. Also, uh, <laughs> yeah, as in browser, it just is like, oh yeah, we've patched, it. Representative. We've patched it both. Right. So yeah, you could save it. You could definitely click save. And then, so for example, you could put it on share Elm, but a, a program associated with an execution. And then you can say, like something weird is going on here and post it to the list. And then everyone could reproduce the exact same thing that you did with mouse moves and everything. That would be nice. That's really that would be awesome. really cool. The, the problem with, I thought it would be really good for making automated tests. The problem is that anytime you change what inputs you use or your, uh, any part of your signal graph, it breaks. And also, uh, 
you could you would have to make custom assertions at the end or at some state along the program because unless you never want your program to change, you wouldn't want to assert that the state is the same as it was when you originally executed. So if you were making a big release and you wanted to make sure that nothing ever changed, you could say, okay, this is our inputs and this is the even store, the collage that comes out of it, and then say, we want it to look exactly like this for all time. And then you would, you would have a 100% um, foolproof, yeah. pixel perfect, you know, uh, assertion, regression test. But it wouldn't work with refactoring because if a signal, okay, if you use the same inputs and have the same output, then I guess it would work. Yeah, but you can change anything in the middle. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference between this and the, the current hot swapping. So the current hot swapping, if any of these nodes change, it, it stops, it won't let you do it. But this one, we only care about these ones, the, the inputs. And if those don't change, it's okay. show you what it does. It's really simple. So it does stop all your values from being garbage collected, uh -huh. oh, obviously. Yeah. Okay. But uh, where's my code? Here, the debugger. So uh, when we wrap notify, we go re we call record event. And record event just creates an object with an ID value and a time set. Mm -hmm. And if this value could be very big, then it won't be garbage collected. But we're not making a copy of everything because it's immutable. We know that it will live on mm -hmm. and not change. So it's just, if, if your program doesn't take a lot of memory, the debugger won't take a lot of memory. So basically you're only recording the inputs. You're not actually recording the internal program. No, no. That's, that's brilliant. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, yeah. There's a bug here, maybe I can play it for you. I need the focus to be here. Yeah, he can go very high. Um, there's a small bug, which would be cool to reproduce because <coughs> if your page takes too long to load, the first frame is very long. And in Mario, the, uh, here's his position. So his, his Y position is the time delta times the velocity. So if you have a really long frame, he jumps really high. Oh, right. I had this in one of my games tonight. I did a filter on the FPS um, to filter out any times that were twice as long as the, the time I would have liked. It. I think that the better approach is just don't use T. Fix T, say you have 30 frames per second. So instead of doing FPS 25, do FPS yeah. frames per second. And then you know what your expected time would be and you just use that. But then you get less with it. Well, that's, it's, so it's, it's possible. Not, the, the, the animation will not be proportional to the time steps. That's, that's true, but you don't want it to be because if, then if the frame is longer, he moves longer. And you don't really notice it because it's only slightly longer, but it's strange that some frames you can jump this much higher than other frames. It is, okay, so yeah. maybe what you could do is the way, is it the way his position is updated is you look at the length of the frame and you use some interpolation. It's too long, right? So you have more 
Yeah, so it would be yeah. much, much more complicated to implement the case where if it's m more than 40 milliseconds, then you have to do the graphing calculator, figure out his position, and then put him there. Yeah. Um, I did ask this my version of um, where uh, if, if it intersects with oh, the yeah. ball and then I yeah. calculate the, the that's what how it balances. That's the core. I still have some line library that does some I should probably share it. <laughs> <laughs> it's on GitHub somewhere.